It's my proud privilege to welcome in our midst one of India's best minds, actually, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Samyal. And uh, the best way to introduce him, first of all, is to remind you all that today is April Fool's Day. <laughs> and uh, the tradition goes way back, as you know, both in Europe and in India. Though in India, you know, when we say Buramad Mano Holi Hai, it's very similar, that you, pay, you play pranks on people, and uh, then you say that, don't feel bad. So for half a minute, I thought he's not going to show up, you know, because he's a great prankster, you know, if you know him. Because creative people think out of the box. You know, you can't predict exactly what they will do or what they will say. But I'm so glad you've arrived. And uh, according to the tradition of celebrating April Fool's Day, Baraabaji ke baad April Fool's nahi hota. Agar aap videsh jayenge, Baraabaji tak ye sab hota hai. After 12 o'clock, if you play a prank, you become the fool, not the person you fool, right? So uh, uh, let's also not forget that uh, in both the West and the East, the role of the fool was very important. The fool was actually a very wise man. You know, if you go to Shakespearean plays, Feste, The Fool and King Lear, you know, these were extremely wise people who never belonged to any particular group, whether it was a faction of the court, and whether they were or the opposition. And the truth is, only they could criticize the king and get away with it. Otherwise, in the kind of uh, system I don't want to call it occidental despotism, because they always talk about oriental despotism. <laughs> but the king's word was law, and from you know, Henry VIII, if you didn't like somebody, you could get them killed also. But the fool could tell the king you know, what the truth was. And in our tradition as well, the Vidushak Hotatha. You see, the Vidushak was an incredibly wise person. So I want to tell you all that uh, Despite being a little bit of a prankster, Sanjeev Sandalji is a very wise man. In fact, this lecture series was also uh, a product of one of our chance conversations, you know, this distinguished lecture series, where he says you should get the best minds of India to come to the institute. Okay? And I immediately acted on it when I became director last year, and we started this new lecture series. Thank you so much for coming and gracing us with your presence. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Sanjeev Ji's background. Uh, he was uh, educated at uh, Sri Ram College of Commerce in Delhi, and then he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, uh, after which he was picked up by Dosha Bank, and he spent many years in uh, Singapore as the head of strategy, investment, and global planning. And in fact, a few years ago, I was in Singapore myself, there was a big Indian Ocean conference and uh, they were, you know, there was a buzz that he was going to come back to India, which happened soon after. But the reason I mentioned the conference is that's when this book called The Ocean of Churn was launched. Okay, I urge you all to read it. It's also been translated into Hindi and other languages. It's a best-selling book about the importance of the Indian Ocean. Uh, earlier, he also, I mean, and, and he's also written revisionary histories which challenge the established 
notions of what happened in the past. On, for example, Ashoka, he completely changes what our impression of Ashoka is. And earlier, he wrote a wonderful book on the Indian Renaissance, okay? And the thesis of the book is after 1,000 years, there's going to be another rise of India of a magnitude that you cannot even imagine. And he was saying this in 2008, 2009, long time before, you know, the present dispensation was even on the horizon, except in Gujarat, okay? So there was a kind of, uh, uh, should I say, vision in these books which was unique. Uh, he's also written a wonderful book. Sudhir ji, aage aage. Professor Sudhir Chandra, aage aage. Kya hal hai? Good to see you, sir. You are looking you wiser and wiser. We were talking about fools and wise men because it's April Fool's Day. Those who cannot be wiser is good. Good, good, good. And those who are neither wise nor look wise can be fools, such as myself. But to carry on with my narrative, another wonderful book he's written. It's uh, actually for children, but it's it's a fantastic book. It's one of my favorites. It's called The Incredible History of India's Geography. So please read this book. It's very readable and it goes back to Pangaea or even before that. You know, when there were only two continents in the world. Gondwana was one and there was another continent made up of the north as it were. And, uh, and you know, he talks about, uh, you know, how geography has affected you know, our culture, our history, our politics, and so forth. And it's written for children, so to speak. It's got lovely illustrations also. So I urge you to read that book. Um, and here's his latest book. It's called India in the Age of Ideas. This is based on a number of columns that he wrote, selected writings from 2006 to 2018. He's also written a book of uh, humorous anecdotes. Am I right? Uh, called satire. Satire. What's it called? Tea? Life over two beers. Beers, not tea. You see, beers is more suitable. But life over two beers. Penguin published it. So he's a very versatile thinker and uh, a very creative person. We're delighted to have you here. And we are really waiting to listen to your talk on heroic histories of forgotten revolutionaries of India and their contribution to India's freedom struggle. Thank you. Thank you. I give you, I give you. Thank you, Bhagavan, for a very generous introduction. And the problem with these introductions very often is that I have to now live up to it. So now that you have raised the expectations, I'll have to work much harder. Anyway, it is a pleasure to be here. It's a beautiful setting, of course, uh, to be in this um, uh, institute. Uh, this is the first time I've been here, although, of course, I, I have uh, seen photographs of it over the years, and I'm a history buff. So I'm familiar about many doings over here of a hundred years ago, but it's nice to come to this building. And in fact, many of the things I'm going to talk about must have been discussed in this building with some indignation, because I'm going to talk about India's revolutionaries and their role in the Indian freedom struggle. Now, why do I want to talk about them? Well, quite apart from the fact that some part of it is my own family history, the reason I'm interested in this is because I feel that in many ways, the history of the freedom struggle that we have ended up with is a partial one. It has ended up essentially telling one stream, i.e. the Congress's stream, of our struggle for in independence. And so we end up basically with a little bit about the, uh, the Congress before the coming of Gandhi, a lot about the period after he came, and about the non-violent uh, movement. But the impression you end up with is that uh, effectively we very gently suggested to the British that they should leave, and they, being very polite, left. Now that is not exactly the history um, that, uh, that would come through if you begin to explore many other uh, histories that existed. And there were many other groups of people also pushing for independence. One of these groups, perhaps the most important of these groups, as I will argue, was the revolutionaries. Now, the names of many of these revolutionaries are still reasonably well known, because these are not very ancient events. These happened 
some of it in living memory. <coughs> but the problem is that while you may know the name of a Bhagat Singh or a Chandrasekhar Azad, um, or even maybe the name of Raj Bihari Bose or some of the others, you get the impression that some of this was, you know, individual acts of bravery. You know, somebody went and shot somebody or somebody threw a bomb somewhere. And there was a random acts of bravery and there was no real plan. And this is partly because it's deliberately been presented to us that way because effectively what you wanted is that there is one narrative of mainstream struggle with these things thrown in something somewhere along the side. But what I'm going to try and show you is in fact this was not the case. The revolutionaries were a well-organized group who, who over a period of a half a century kept up a struggle, an armed struggle of resistance against the British. They were organized not only within India, they had satellite groups and embassies in the rest of the world. Um, they had in North America, they had embassies in Berlin, not just in the Second World War, where many people know about Subhash Bose's visit, but in the First World War, with enormous uh, impact on uh, the events that happened subsequently. Um, they had, of course, uh, units in places like Singapore, in Tokyo, uh, and even in London. And if you do not understand the, this group of people, their linkages, uh, you will not only not understand what they were trying to do, i.e. their history, you will not even be able to understand what either the British or, the, or even the Congress was trying to do, because in many ways, the Congress itself was reacting to many of the things this group was doing. And even within the Congress, there was a lot of give and take between the groups. So we have ended up not only just with the Congress's worldview, we have ended up with one stream of the Congress's worldview. There are many streams even within the Congress, and uh, many of these streams uh, had close links with uh, this uh, revolutionary group. Now, the revolutionary movement, um, to understand it, you need to first go back, obviously, to the very end of the 19th century. Now, the end of the 19th century is interesting because essentially, by this time, all the traditional uh, social groups and their resistance to British rule had basically ended. Um, the one big ending to that was, of course, 1857-58, but there were some smatterings of resistance even after that. So you had, for example, Birsa Munda and the tribal was resisting. There were periods of resistance, for example, with uh, in Manipur. Incidentally, Manipur is literally the last part of India that was subdued. Um, and so there were these things. But this traditional uh, resistance basically had ended by uh, 1870s, 1880s. And so out of that, or ashes of that, a new movement began to come through, which had its roots in a new way of thinking. And of course, some part of it came from uh, the influence of new ideas that were percolating through, ironically from the introduction of British style education. Uh, and this popped up creating a new middle class. Some of that middle class, of course, was very much signed up to be Anglophile, but others also took the same knowledge and used it against the British in many ways. And so this began to create all kinds of dynamics. One of the dynamics, of course, was the setting up of the Indian National Congress. Um, and, as many of you know, that one of the reasons the British were quite keen on allowing this group to come up was as a safety weapon. But this was not the only group that was coming up. There were other movements as well, many of them religious, for example, the Arya Samaj, or the religious reawakening in Bengal, which culminated with uh, Vivekanand uh, and so on. So there were all these other streams as well. But also, there was the rise of the thinking that came through with, with people like Lala Lajpat Rai, Tilak, and Pal, the Lal Bal Pal combination. And the first kind of recorded act of uh, 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 sort of um, act of revolutionaries, uh, act uh, of armed resistance, so to speak, in the new format uh, that happened was essentially happened in Pune. Uh, thanks to the influence of the ideas that were then bubbling up from this new group that had become, come up. A much more strident view than what was there in the earlier group of the Congress, what would later be known as the moderates. And as a result of which, we have the Chapeka brothers, uh, who then assassinated 
um, a local official in Pune, um, in, which is now, uh, there is a small shrine across on, on, on one side of the road where this event happened, which is across from a mall, well-known mall in Mumbai, uh, in Pune. Mm -hmm. And so you can still go and visit the place, but it's uh, not most Punekers do not actually know about it. I hunted this place down one uh, hot summer afternoon. And that was it. But at this stage, it is fair to say that, say that the, the, the revolutionary movement was what is usually it's accused of, a random act of uh, violence with no real grander plan to it. And it, this particular act didn't really lead to anything. However, by the first decade of the 20th century, in Bengal, it began to show up in multiple uh, pockets. And it showed up, interestingly, in something called the Anishalan Samiti. And Anishalan Samiti was, was literally a network of young men, occasionally women, and these were sports clubs. The place that was set up is still there in uh, North Calcutta. It's a place not much bigger than this room. A uh, little maybe double the size of this. Uh, it is still a sports club. Uh, there's still a badminton, there's now a badminton court. However, in those days it was a wrestling and gymnastics club. And so this network of, of, uh, of Anishalan Samitis began to pop up. They, and a gentleman called Aurobindo Ghosh turned up on the scene. He had gone, he had been sent by his father, who was one of the Anglophiles that I mentioned earlier. And he wanted his son to have nothing to do with Indian culture and had sent his kids off to Britain to study. And Aurobindo Ghosh had then grown up, essentially learning nothing about his own culture. And had then learnt his, about his own culture from a European perspective, sitting in London preparing for his ICS exams. And he literally learned Bengali as a foreigner. But having done that, he then got imbibed along with it, many of the other ideas that were popping up in Europe of nationalism, of course. A lot of it Italian, incidentally. Mazzini, which is now not many people realize, was a very important person in thinking of uh, Indian revolutionaries at that stage. So, Mazzini, Garibaldi, and others, and of course other ideas, combining with, of course, the ideas that were emerging of religious revivalism that were there in India, both of these kind of collided in his head. And he returned to India, not as an ICS officer, but to become, for a while, working as a private secretary of the Gaikwads of Baroda. Sarajiva. And they incidentally have a major role, I'm not going to go down that, but, but the Gaikwad uh, of Baroda have an important role in our history uh, of the freedom struggle. And they were patrons of many important characters, including Ambedkar and, of course, uh, uh, Aurobindo Ghosh. Now, Aurobindo Ghosh now began to organize this group and he signed up with Lal Bal and Pal. Uh, and this is how the group, which is now in the Congress known as the extremists, came about. Now, even the terms extremist and moderates tell you something about who came to power and wrote the history later on. The term extremist is not how the Lal Bal Pal group called themselves. They call themselves. Garam Dal. Well, they call themselves the new party. And the colloquial term was the Garam Naram Dal and the Garam Dal. But of course, Aurobindo Ghosh liked to use the terms nationalists and, for the other side, loyalists. So, this was what was going on when, of course, 1905, the partition of Bengal came. And this kind of put a match to this whole movement. And you had, of course, the big protests and so on. This is the stage when this whole thing began to take shape. And Aurobindo Ghosh who was, of course, one of, uh, very inspired by Anandamot, the book, and Vande Matram. This is when Vande Matram became uh, very famous as a song of resistance. And he then began to think of creating a group of sannyasi warriors. And he was not just inspired by Anandamot, he was also inspired by an earlier generation of resist fighting for resistance, and particularly the Marathas and Shivaji. So he began to look for a place in the Narmada area where he would set up a mutt to train his revolutionaries for armed resistance. But all of this got carried away because by the time he got all this together, his brother Barin Ghosh, meanwhile, had set up a similar group in Kolkata in a place called Manikpala. This is just north of, Kol north of 
North Kolkata. It's already within urban Kolkata, so it is North North Kolkata. The place still has a sort of a semi-ruralist feel, and there they had a bagan garden, a garden house, where they set up a bomb factory. Unfortunately, uh, this group carried out a few uh, um, uh, attacks, and they came under the lens, and very quickly this Manikpala facility was um, taken over, Barin Ghosh was uh, arrested, many of the people of this group were arrested in, and, and put into Alipur jail, which is why it's called Alipur jail. Another group from this was sent off to Rongpur jail, in, including a gentleman called Onadi Khan So these people were all captured and Aurobindo Ghosh himself was arrested. Um, his brother and most of the others were then carted off to Kalapani. But Aurobindo Ghosh, however, it, they found it very difficult to pin anything on him, even though he was clearly involved and he was editing a newspaper called, <coughs> I think it was called Bande Mataram, uh, which had clearly incendiary uh, content. But nevertheless, they let him off for a little while and he promptly escaped to Chandanagar and then to Pondicherry. And for several years after that, he would continue to be very much involved in the revolutionary movement based out of Pondicherry. Although he would, after, after the First World War, drift off to becoming uh, much more into cultural and spiritual matters. And why he did that is another story for another day, uh, which is also interesting with ramifications to this day. But meanwhile, the sort of, after this particular episode in Kolkata, the hotbed sort of, of this movement shifted, interestingly, London, to a place called the India House, which was a hostel, which is near the Highgate area. I visited it just a few months ago. It's just a house there, a large house. It's still there, it still has a plot, where a group of Indian students in, in, in London uh, began to gather around Shamji Krishna Varma. Yeah, Shamji Krishna Varma, who hired the place. But the, but the thinker who was kind of driving all of this was Veer Savarkar. <clears throat> and one of his sort of disciples, so to speak, in 1908, Madan Lal carried out an assassination of a uh, Wiley. And Wiley was, among other things, of course, the secretary to the Viceroy, who used to live right here, and had therefore spent some time in this building. But of course, when he had gone back, he had been given the job of keeping track of these revolutionary networks in in London, and so he was uh, 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 targeted and killed. The place he carried out this assassination, incidentally, is now an imperial college, and there is a very tall Queen's Tower, there, which was part of the building where this assassination happened. Of course, he was hanged. Very quickly, Savarkar was then uh, zeroed in on as the person who was likely to be causing all this trouble. Uh, he had also uh, been found to be perhaps the source of Browning pistols that were, carried, were being used in India for various uh, attacks. And so he was then arrested and was shipped off, uh, I think, 1909 or 10 to uh, uh, India. Along the way, a very dramatic event took place where he, in Marseille. He jumped off the ship and swam to the shore. And uh, the idea was that Hikaji Kama would come in a car and pick him up. Sadly, she turned up a little late, and, and unfortunately, the local policeman who um, uh, captured him and handed him on back to the British, which was rather unfortunate because he was then promptly sent to Kalapani and would then stay there till 1921 and then further in Ratnagiri for another several years. So, uh, if you go to uh, the cellular jail in uh, Port Blair, uh, one of the, the only cell that is still identifiable, because many people were sent there, but they used to change their cells. The only cell that is identifiable is that of a Savarkar, because uh, it was a special cell with his, which had a double door, and it was deliberately put right in front of the gallows, so that Savarkar would be repeatedly reminded of uh, the position he was in. So now, with Savarkar out of the way, this was kind of uh, the, the grouping in London got dissipated, and a gentleman, one of his other followers called Hardeyal, escaped to the US, and I'll come back to him shortly. Now, meanwhile, back in India, this uh, group, this network of uh, Anishinaabe 
Samiti group network was yeah, still active despite the loss of Aurobindo and uh, Barangosh. And they then began to organize themselves <coughs> in and around Chandanagar because that was clearly a useful place to organize themselves because it was under French rule. And from there, Raj Bihari Bose managed to get hold of the instructions of how to create the sophisticated bombs. And in 1912, uh, he carried out an attempt to kill um, Lord Hardinge, uh, who was then uh, going through Chandni Chok uh, by throwing a bomb from him. Uh, um, um, uh, I think it was, a, uh, in, uh, yeah, it was a 1912. Uh, the place where the bomb was thrown is quite interesting. Um, you can still identify it because uh, it is a place called uh, Katra Dhulia, which is a wholesaler's market, which is still there on uh, that um, road. Uh, it is literally across the road from Parathe Valley Gali. So if you ever go to eat Parathe Valley Gali, just cross, cross Chandni Chowk Road. On the other side, there is a wholesaler market. That is where. The building itself is there except two more floors, two or three floors more had been built. But the bomb was thrown from the first floor. And it was a small group which threw the bomb, which included, um, uh, uh, of course, Raj Bihari Bose himself and a couple of other accomplices, including a gentleman called Sachindranath Sanyal, who had become his recent lieutenant uh, and he had recruited him from Varanasi. Now, the bombing uh, itself was, came very, very close to succeeding. Um, Hardinge was very, very badly injured. It would take many months to recover. Um, uh, and one of his attendants would get killed, but he would survive. <clears throat> but uh, Raj Bihari Bose himself would escape. All of them would escape. But he would escape. And he then went back to um, the Indian Forest Institute in Dehradun, where he used to work and promptly organized a uh, protest uh, or uh, uh, some, uh, sort of meeting to protest against this attack. Uh, and uh, the place all of this was going on incidentally is not the new Indian Forest Institute building that you now go and see. It's a very grand building if you visited the institute in Dharadun. Uh, this is not that one. This is the much more modest in uh, institution that used to exist near what is now the Tibet Bazaar area. Uh, the buildings are still a part of the Indian Forest Institute, uh, but uh, and it's one small office is still there. But there is in that complex a red building at the back, if you visit it, which is semi-abandoned. That is where Raj Bihari Bose used to work. Anyway, um, Raj Bihari Bose, then, although many of some of the members of his group did get arrested uh, and punished and hanged, in fact, um, they kept their mouth shut about Raj Bihari Bose himself and about Sachindranath Sani, and they would remain um, at large. Um, and meanwhile, remember Lala Hadriya, the follower of Savarkar, uh, who used to be, incidentally, uh, used to study at St. John's College, Oxford, which is my college at Oxford. Um, uh, no surprises for, uh, no prizes for guessing why I chose that particular college. Uh, and Lala Hadriya had gone off to uh, California. San Francisco, where there were a lot, and the entire coast, uh, both the Canadian and the American side, had then, by then, had a fairly large number of uh, Punjabis, particularly Sikhs, uh, but also non-Hindu uh, Punjabis, who had settled along that coast, and had become fairly quickly quite prosperous in the agriculture. So Lala Hardaya settled amongst them and used the network, particularly of Gurdwaras and other Indian associations to spread very incendiary uh, uh, revolutionary ideas of, uh, 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 among them. Um, using a uh, newspaper or magazine called The Gadar, or The Revolution. And very quickly it became an absolute, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was not just in, along there, there were copies being popping up in, in India, in Singapore, in um, Hong Kong, wherever there happened to be uh, an Indian community, uh, it was popping up. And so, already, uh, he was under the uh, radar. But the Americans at that stage did not do anything. Um, they had, of course, freedom of speech. And, of course, uh, this is before the First World War and so on. So they kind of uh, let it be. In any case, remember, uh, even amongst Americans at that stage, remember, there was still uh, some uh, semblance of anti-British uh, feeling, uh, having been only a century ago, having fought a war with uh, with Britain. Uh, the White House, after all, is named White 
uh, house because it has painted after having been burned down by the British. So, so, <laughs> so this was how things were. Now comes the First World War. Now the First World War was a very important event in the revolutionary movement. And it is related, again, to something that Savarkar had done before he was arrested. And it's very important here that even though Savarkar would later be away from this movement, first because of imprisonment and then he would drift off uh, in much more indirectly into Hindu uh, nationalism, he played a very important role in the beginning, not only in terms of recruiting all these people I just mentioned, but also in writing a book which was very, very influential in the uh, thinking of the revolutions, which is a book on the War of Independence of 1857. Why was this book so influential? Because effectively it made the case that the way to free India was to cause a revolt in the Indian army or Indian armed forces more generally and that the way to freedom was consequently on instigating uh, a revolt in this group uh, and undermining the loyalty of the British in, in the Indian soldier to the British was the key. Now this is a very important idea you have to remember because this is the unifying idea of the revolutionaries throughout this period. And I will show you that more or less everything they were ultimately doing, they may be carrying out occasional acts of reprisal, but this is the thing that they really want to focus on. And the First World War is the obvious time which gives them suddenly an opportunity to do something because, of course, there are large numbers of Indians being recruited, the numbers of European soldiers in India suddenly shrinks and is obviously being having to be deployed in, in, in Europe, but also large numbers of Indians are being trained and armed uh, using uh, armaments, modern armaments, and so uh, not surprisingly this idea was very, very uh, attractive. And the person who decided to take this up uh, was uh, Raj Bihari Bose. And Raj Bihari Bose and Sachin Sanyal uh, began to then uh, uh, organize on one hand the Bengal revolutionaries, Arunachal and Samiti, there was another group, group called the Jugantor group, and the uh, group uh, in Punjab who were being instigated by all this Gadar literature. And so they began, as the First World War got going, uh, they began to contact all these uh, uh, new, new regiments that were being raised. And the idea was that in February 20, uh, 1915, uh, there would be a grand uprising uh, of all these uh, groups, not just in India, but in all other parts. And, revolutionary literature had been spread and so on. And what was going to happen was going to be this great revolt, not so dissimilar to uh, what happened in, in uh, 1857. Sadly, just a few days before this thing was happening, what, uh, <clears throat> there was a mole in this group, the organizing group, who, of course, went and let out the secret to the British intelligence. And the British overnight changed all the uh, guards at armories, because the idea had been that the Indian soldiers would raid the armory, grab the thing, and then uh, it would get going. So all the, the, the uh, armories were put under severe guard. And so uh, this whole plan completely fell apart, except in one place in Singapore. Also Chittagong. This is not to do with Chittagong. I'll come to Chittagong later. Nothing happened in Chittagong. It was in Singapore. And for about a week, uh, the uh, Baloch and there were Baloch Muslim and Punjabi Muslim soldiers of the, uh, in uh, Singapore, based in Singapore, uh, revolted and uh, they held the city for about a week and they were interestingly put down with Japanese soldiers who happened to be available at that time. Japan was an ally of the British, so they actually helped put down this revolt. Uh, ironical given what would happen later. Uh, anyway, this revolt would die and this was a complete failure. However, Meanwhile, while all of this was going on, the Germans caught on to the fact that this was a useful uh, movement. And so they began to contact all these revolutionaries all over the world, uh, including in India, but also those based in Europe, based in, the, in, in uh, North America, and began to create networks and began funding them. They, in fact, also set up an office with full uh, embassy uh, rights in Berlin for this group. Uh, and Sarojini Naidu's elder brother, Chakra, was uh, one of the Yes, yeah, so he was based there. And so were many others. <clears throat> so this group then began to put together uh, this plan 
to cause mass revolts. How are they going to do it? So they, they uh, uh, began to uh, contact various people. But remember, meanwhile, after the failure of the uprising back in India, uh, Raj Bihari Bose had to flee Lahore. He fled for a while to Varanasi, where he hid with the extended Sanyal clan. But then he went off to Kolkata and escaped to Japan, because he, they obviously the British were looking for him, uh, where he would stay for the next several decades. Uh, Satyendranath Sanyal as well was arrested uh, shortly thereafter and sent off uh, to uh, Kalapani and many others were as well. So the leadership now suddenly shifted to back to Bengal to a gentleman called Bhaga Jyoti, who was the leader of one of these groups called the Jugantar group. And they along with Chakto and the Berlin group began to acquire large amounts of arms in North America. Something like 30,000 guns were purchased and they put into a ship called the Maverick and set sail uh, through the Philippines to be landed on Urisa coast where they would, and meanwhile this group had already trained about 30,000 people in the network of gymnasiums that mentioned how to use basic arm uh, guns. And the idea was a very interesting one was that this group on Christmas day 1915 would suddenly turn up in Kolkata and take over governor's house. Now why governor's house? Because there was a tradition that the viceroy, because remember even though the capital had been announced to move to Delhi, there were no buildings there in Delhi yet. So the governor general and viceroy still lived in Calcutta. And every Christmas day, all the top military and civilian officials would meet for lunch, Christmas day lunch, in Kolkata in the governor's house. This is the same one that is today the governor's uh, house in uh, for West Bengal in, in Kolkata. And the idea was to surround it and take these guys hostage. Unfortunately, the German agent, a certain Mr. Herr Kraft, based in Singapore, um, they decided to switch sides and spilt all the beans. So unfortunately, all these shipments of guns uh, did not uh, were intercepted and didn't get their way to the Orissa coast. They were supposed to be landed, by the way, uh, at uh, near the uh, near Baleshwar, uh, near very near uh, 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 Chandipur, where are we now test our um, uh, missiles. And Bhaga Jyotin, by the way, was waiting for them, but of course nothing arrived. Instead, uh, the British uh, surrounded him and there was a shootout in which he fought to the end and was killed. So that too failed. But there were many other such attempts. There was yet another attempt during this time uh, that the Germans uh, put a mission to Kabul uh, of two gentlemen. Uh, one was Maulana Barkatul and Raja Mahendra Singh, who made their way through Mesopotamia, through Iran, to Kabul, and set up a provisional government of free India in Kabul. And their idea was to instigate a revolt by the, uh, the Afghan king, and try and invade, uh, by promising him that the Turks and, 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 and the Germans would bring an army through Iran and help them uh, invade India from the northwest. So this was another attempt. Unfortunately, this completely failed uh, because uh, remember the Afghans had been beaten by the British on three separate occasions in major wars over the previous century and simply didn't have the uh, stomach for the fight. So that one failed as well. Now many people may now say that you know these were outrageous plans, and how could possibly the Germans have imagined that this was going to succeed? But the fact is. Outrageous plans do succeed. Um, many of you know about Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia was exactly the same plan attempted by the British on the Arabs to create a revolt, and it worked. Uh, there was an even more famous example was, of course, Lenin. Uh, people forget that Lenin was actually a German, uh, the Bolsheviks were a German-funded project to, for, uh, to force the Russians to stop fi uh, fighting on their eastern front. So Lenin was brought in a special train from, uh, from his uh, exile in Switzerland, taken through uh, Germany, through, Swi uh, through Sweden, through Finland, and then went to Peter uh, St. Petersburg. And the entire thing and substantial amounts of money were given to the Bolsheviks uh, to fight the white Russians uh, in order to, to um, get them to 
throw out his art uh, and take over the country, and which he did, and very promptly then, uh, of course, uh, signed uh, with the Germans a ceasefire, which is exactly what the Germans felt uh, wanted. So the point I'm making to you is, uh, while some of these plans that the Germans had, along with the revolutionaries, may now sound outrageous, the fact is, history is full of such plans, and, you know, as I said, the <coughs> Germans uh, have succeeded in, a, uh, in one, uh, such an equally absurd plan. Uh, and in fact, one would argue that it was probably even more difficult to imagine uh, Lenin taking over uh, Russia than it was to imagine, say, Rajvi Haribos managing to do it. So, anyway, uh, the Indian side uh, of plan of the project completely failed. So, that was the end of that. Now, the war ends, 1919, and the soldiers all begin to come home. A lot of them, of course, were from Punjab. And as they began to come back, the Gadarites who had survived continued to begin to infiltrate the returning soldiers. And British intelligence begins to get reports, more and more reports, that these soldiers are very unhappy for a variety of reasons they may have had. Now, de demobilized soldiers are always dangerous. Uh, and so these guys were coming home, um, and uh, they were getting radicalized by this nationalist literature that the Gadarites are there behind, even though the Gadarites themselves uh, were not there. And this is the context in which, incidentally, the Rowlet Acts were introduced. This is very important. You know, people say, you know, there were these agitation by Gandhi against the Rowlet Act and so on. But why were they there in the first place? The real reason the Rowlet Acts were there was everything to do with the revolutionaries and their radicalization of the returning soldiers coming back to the Punjab. And, of course, I will not go into the details of it, all of this then, ultimately, that sequence of events cul cul uh, culminated in 1919, almost exactly a year ago, just 15 days away from uh, uh, a centenary of the horrible massacre in Jallianwala Bagh. Now, the Jallianwala Bagh was, uh, of course, a major, major event. Um, it, it shook India, it shook Gandhi specifically. Remember, Gandhi till this point in time was very much a part of the, what uh, Aurobindo would have called the loyalist camp. And it is here he becomes much more aggressive about demanding uh, full freedom. And then a sequence of events takes place, which leads to the non-cooperation movement being launched. Um, and Meanwhile, the British, um, who, um, in order to try and quell this uh, sort of rapid uh, deterioration in, in, in conditions, um, they released many of the uh, uh, revolutionaries lodged in um, Kalapani as a part of a goodwill gesture. So many of these uh, old revolutionaries from Baran Ghosh, um, Sachin Ranath Sanyal, and so on, were released and they returned back to the mainland uh, as a result of twenty. 1921, as a result of that amnesty, with the one exception of Savarkar, who was still held and considered way too dangerous, and he would be released uh, uh, somewhat later. Now, this whole thing began to culminate. Some of the revolutionaries who came back then participated in the non cooperation movement. But Sachindranath Sanyal was very suspicious of Gandhi. His view was that Gandhi would sooner or later sell out. Because his view was Gandhi had only recently come back. His entire record was of by and large supporting British military ventures, whether it was in the Boer War or in the, even in the First World War where Gandhi had uh, recruited soldiers for the, um, for the first uh, for British cause. So Sachin Sanyal's view was this is going to all end badly because this, he will ultimately uh, collaborate and uh, pull off the movement at its moment of uh, victory. And uh, for, uh, and at least from the perspective of his group, uh, that is precisely what happened uh, with Chauri Chauri in 1922. Suddenly, uh, one event, uh, uh, an act of uh, event, of uh, violent <coughs> event, led to the entire movement being unwound. And of course, this really enraged the revolutionaries including those who had participated in the non-cooperation movement. And this included people who would later become very important, like uh, Bismil and so on. So this is the moment at which the revolutionaries 
who had, till that point in time, had fairly good links, at least with some branches of the Congress, um, uh, really fell away from the Congress movement, even though they would continue to have some links here and there because of old time's sake, so to speak, C.R. Das, for example. But of course, C.R. Das himself split away along with Motilal Nehru as a result of this Shauri uh, Chauhan uh, So you then see uh, Sachin Sanya begin to pick up the pieces of his movement, remember, which had been shattered in the First World War from the failure of the Ghadar movement, the failure of Juganto, the crackdowns against the Anishinaabe and so on. And so he then, in 1923 or 24, he creates a new group called the Hindustan Republican Association. And under it, the Hindustan Republican Army. Now, these names are not <coughs> incidental. You have to realize that this is the time when you also had the movement in Ireland, which succeeded, which of course irritated the revolutionaries even more, because they said that, look, if a tiny place right next to Britain can succeed, surely a large place like us could have easily done it, but for Gandhi. So Sachin Sanya now writes a manifesto for this party, and he begins to recruit people. And of course, Bismil becomes his, his right-hand man, but there are others. And this is the period in which he recruits uh, Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Ashwatullah, and many others. And so they obviously have a problem, of course, that the that, that Second World War moment has gone. They've lost the moment. Um, the momentum from uh, the uh, non-cooperation movement is also gone. And they're very despondent at this stage. So what do they do? And so they begin to again say, that, look, let's begin to accumulate guns. Obvious thing to do if you're an armed movement. Um, and so they send off a, interestingly, they had in their network of sports clubs a, a swimming club. And one of the swimmers was going to Germany uh, on a swimming competition and he was told that he could acquire uh, 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 guns, particularly a, a pistol called, um, what was it? <laughs> no, not the it's at the M. It's a Mauser. Mauser. So get out of Mauser guns. But they had to pay for it. This was a problematic thing that as they began to get these supplies of Mauser guns, they had to pay for it and they had pitifully little money. So after attempting to do some petty decoities to gather money, which uh, they were pretty bad at from what I could gather, uh, simply because, you know, they didn't really want to hurt anyone. So if at any point anybody pushed back, uh, they uh, basically fled. So this was clearly not going anywhere. Uh, so at this juncture, uh, Bismil came up with the, the plan of doing a robbery of a train uh, at a place called Kakori. Now, let me point out that they must have been pretty uh, desperate for money because, for making these payments because it was a very dangerous plan. Because it was, it did have guards, uh, it would immediately put them under the scanner. And of course, uh, Bismil's right hand man was Ashwakullah, who thought it was a terrible idea. <coughs> Nevertheless, they did carry out this attempt in, in, in 1925, and they did manage to rob a lot of money, but uh, the British intelligence very quickly managed to track them down, and uh, it ended all very badly, with many of them um, uh, getting uh, arrested, which included Sachinarath Salihal, uh, uh, one of his relatives, Rajendra Lahiri, would be hanged, Bismil who would be hanged, Ashwakullah, sadly for his objections to this plan, was also captured and hanged. Uh, and, um, um, and, and Bhupendra Nath Sanya, who was uh, Sachin Sanya, the young one of his brothers, who was also sent off to jail and so on. And so this second movement also came a crop. And now, yet again, the senior leadership had been wiped out. And this is when a very young, I think very early 20s uh, man called Chandrasekhar Azad, by chance, took control of this movement. And he began to organize these groups. Um, and he was an expert in uh, disguise. So he would you know, sometimes be a mechanic, sometimes a priest, or whatever. And from Varanasi, he began to gather all of this. And this is important to remember. I'm mentioning this because not too many people realize that Varanasi was a hub of all of this, including the Bengal movement. Uh, because all of these people were in Varanasi. Sachin Rath Sanyal, uh, Bismil, 
Chandrasekhar Azad and all of these fellows where it was tiny lanes of Varanasi. Um, and so this movement began to rapidly gather pace. Now in the middle of all of that, a sort of reinvigoration of the, of the natural movement began to happen after the hiatus and after, after Chauri Chaura, some reinvigoration began to happen. And you, one of the people who was kind of giving it some teeth, so to speak, was one of the old uh, nationalists, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 Lala Rajpatra. And he began to be fairly large protests uh, against uh, the British. And in one of these, uh, he was literally beaten to death in public. This, of course, enraged the revolutionaries who said, time has come now to actually carry out an assassination of the perpetrators. And so they identified two police officers who had done it. Um, but, uh, and then the job was given uh, to Bhagat Singh to, uh, and, and Rajguru to carry out this assassination in Lahore. And uh, they did manage to track these two down, but they only managed to kill Saunders. Uh, it's not even very clear that Saunders was the primary uh, target, but anyway, he was one of the targets. And having shot him and killed him, they then disappeared. And then there is a famous story, of course, of how Bhagat Singh would leave Lahore, uh, dressed, uh, 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 he, would he would shave off his pagri and everything, and he would leave with uh, one of his, another revolutionary's wife, uh, uh, disguised as a couple. Uh, uh, his name was Durga uh, uh, Didi. Everybody called it Durga Didi, and they made their way to Kolkata uh, in a train. So there was a very famous uh, escape uh, that is there, very much part of the uh, revolutionary lore. After that, there were many uh, other events that happened. One of them was, of course, uh, an attempt uh, on the Meerut Delhi train to blow up the Viceroy's train yet again. So the people who lived in this building uh, clearly were targets of this group. Um, and so uh, this attempt to fail, although the train itself was blown up, the Viceroy's carriage escaped. Now, while all of this was going on, um, um, the, 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 uh, remember, uh, you also, what, uh, Bhagat Singh became a very influential uh, character in all of this. <coughs> Although he's not the leader of this movement, Sukhdev and uh, Azad were much more influential. But Bhagat Singh became more and more an ideologue. And towards the uh, late 20s, he began to take on himself many uh, Marxist ideas, which were quite new at that time. Um, and so, in a meeting in, in Feroz Shah Kotla, uh, not far from uh, where the Ashok Stamba is then in the ruins, uh, this group of uh, revolutionaries met and uh, he convinced them to rename uh, the, their group as the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. That's how it became HSRA. Uh, this caused some dissension, incidentally, because not many people, the word socialist was at that time didn't have clear meaning, so there's something bandied about. I mean, everybody from Hitler to Mussolini used it. Um, uh, so nobody quite knew what it meant, uh, but there were those who kind of felt, were also they were anti-Marxists, and of course uh, it was well known that the original founder Sachin Sanyal was an anti-Marxist. So therefore there was some grumbling, but anyway that name change did happen. Now, in the middle of all of this, a plan popped up that they would do, uh, they would throw a bomb. Not necessarily to kill anyone, but to simply cause a flutter uh, in the assembly, the newly built assembly in Delhi, uh, which is now the parliament. And the idea originally was to get two of the younger revolutionaries to do it, but there was a tiff between, uh, within the uh, revolutionaries themselves. And somebody accused Bhagat Singh of not being manly enough, and so <laughs> Bhagat Singh said that he would do it himself. Which it turned out, as you will see, a very foolish move because he, everybody was hunting for him for the Saunders murder. Anyway, on a fateful day, I think it was also in April, um, they had uh, a picnic in Kutsi Abad, uh, which is still exists uh, north of uh, the old, uh, old Delhi. And then they made their way through on Unika Gari to uh, what is now the parliament. And uh, of course, um, <coughs> Batukeshwar Dutt and he threw these bombs and some revolutionary literature and so on and they were captured and um, immediately, uh, you know, the, the British very quickly realized 
that this business of throwing the bomb was the least of the things that they had stumbled upon. The really interesting thing of that was that they had stumbled upon the guy who had killed Saunders, Bhagat Singh. And of course, there was the very famous Lahore trials, um, in which uh, 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 in, the, in the middle of which, of course, they also managed to uh, capture Sukhdev and Rajguru, who had also been a part of that Saunders uh, attack. But of course, three of them refused to go to the court because they, they said that they didn't recognize the, the government uh, of India and consequently not the court. So, that, you know, so uh, they, this, this whole uh, um, trial was held in absentia while uh, the, uh, those on the trial themselves uh, carried out a series of hunger, hunger um, uh, strikes, hunger strikes. Uh, so many of these uh, uh, statements of uh, Bhagat Singh uh, were read out by one of his cellmates, another uh, uh, grand uncle of mine, uh, Jatindranath Sanyal, another younger brother of, uh, of Sachindranath Sanyal. And so um, he read these out in court. Uh, and of course, it didn't cut much ice because ultimately, of course, all three of these uh, gentlemen were hanged at Husainiwala, if I'm not mistaken, a, a place which, which at partition ended up falling on the Pakistan side, but was purchased very expensively back by the Indians for 12 villages after independence in the 1960s. So anyway, um, this was where things were, circa 1930. There was another major event in 1930, uh, which was that of the Chittagong Armory Raid. So this is Shurja, Shurja Shen, who otherwise mastered that. Uh, who also carried out his armory raid. They raided the armory, stole a large number of guns, and then carried out some guerrilla tactics in the hills above uh, Chiragong. Now, why were these people doing all of this? Well, let it be very clear that none of the leaders, even of this movement, believed that these things that they were doing at that time would directly lead to freedom. Because they realized that they were basically relatively small things. What they were really trying to do was simply to keep the movement alive in the face of repeated loss of leadership. So, so that is the context in which you have to see what Shurja Sen did, the context in which you have to see what Bhagat Singh did. It was more important to him to spread the word that the resistance is alive. So this is the context in which all of this was going on. Now, one interesting sort of twist in the tale happens now. I'm going to have some water. Now, remember, so far, the driving force of, uh, sort of ideological force of this movement had been very much nationalism, specifically Hindu nationalism. Um, and even though they were non-Hindus, like Parkatullah, Ashkatullah, etc., and of course the Sikhs as well were a part of this. But this was the driving force was very much at Indian nationalism and very much significantly culturally or even religiously driven. So this is the context in which you have to read uh, Bandi Matra, the full version. It is a Shakta song. It is very much a song visualizing India in the form of Durga, uh, which is obviously very attractive <coughs> Uh, to those of the Shakti tradition, and consequently, remember the three places where this revolutionary movement was taking place, it has long and strong traditions of Durga worship. Bengal, in the form of Durga itself, uh, Maharashtra, the worship of Bhavani, and of course, that was what was driving uh, the, the Marathas and the tradition there, and of course, the worship of Chandi in uh, Punjab. What happens here, of course, is now you have communism, but more specifically Marxism enters the story. <coughs> now, the, as I mentioned, Bhagat Singh himself had turned Marxism towards the very end of his life, had turned to Marxism the very end of his life. But he's not the origin of the Marxist movement at all, because he was himself very much a part of the nationalist movement. He was not its founder, he was not even one of its top leaders. Uh, even when he writes, why I am an atheist, read it, you read the text, um, he, he clearly mentions that he himself is the only atheist in the lot, and he clearly mentions that all his other colleagues, which he mentions, 
Sachinath, Sanyal, Rajendra Lahiri, and others. And he mentions that they were all clearly not atheists, and certainly not Marxists. So the origin of the Marxist communist strain in this movement comes from another interesting character called M. N. Roy. M. N. Roy was a very fascinating character because, and he came originally from the Jugantar group, which I mentioned, which Bhaga Jodin had done. Remember the failed Christmas Day block? Well, he was the guy who Bhaga Jodin had, Bhaga Jodin had sent to Indonesia to look out for these, this ship that was supposed to be bringing these 30,000 guns. And of course it failed, so he was stuck in Indonesia and couldn't come, couldn't come home. So he made his way to uh, the US, but then what happened was that somewhere along the way the US uh, joined the war. And of course all the Gatherites who were there were caught up in what was then called the, the Hindu-German conspiracy. And so all of these guys, including Hardayal and so on, got into serious trouble. Uh, some escaped, some got, were arrested and so on. And Evan Roy himself escaped to Mexico, by which point he had become a Marxist. And he is the founder, interestingly, of the Mexican Communist Party. So here is a random Bengali exile turning up in Mexico and founds the, one of the oldest uh, co communist uh, parties uh, in the world, in fact the oldest one in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, in Mexico. And he then, after the, the revolution in, um, uh, in uh, Soviet, the Soviet Revolution, uh, uh, and Lenin taking over, he made his way uh, to uh, the Soviet Union and he was then given the task of trying to set up a communist party for India, which was set up interestingly in 1920 in guess where, Tashkent of all places around. And interestingly, there is a very interesting record of him being in Tashkent uh, and doing all sort of trying to, and he's meanwhile looking for these refugees of, uh, of uh, refugees of Indian refu revolutionaries who were stuck in various places of Europe uh, and were abandoned basically because Ger Germany had lost the war and they had no patrons and they had sort of, he kind of recruited several of them and brought them to Tashkent and he began training these chaps. So that is how the communist movement came to be. And so then he and some of these people that began to infiltrate back to India and then in the early 30s they began to sort of organize various groups. Unfortunately, the very first attempts got very badly uh, put down. First of all, the nationalists themselves in the, uh, in, in, in the revolutionary movement were very suspicious of them uh, because they saw them as Russian implants. Uh, the Congress Party at that stage, there were some who were sympathetic, like Nehru, but many of them were not, and so on. And so this kind of did, wasn't quite going anywhere. Meanwhile, Emin Roy himself, uh, after the death of Lenin, fell into uh, Stalin's bad books. So he was completely sidelined, and he would then drift off away from communism uh, to creating uh, a new uh, ideology called integral humanism. Radical, radical humanism, radical. sorry. Which, by the way, would influence the integral humanism that now would be the Alupa, the Alupa. So, that is another completely different sort of line of thought that would happen out of all of this. But meanwhile, the movement, the communist Marxist movement in India got interestingly taken over with a fair amount of encouragement, incidentally, and backing of the British rulers here by the British Communist Party with a gentleman called Rajni Palmedat, who was a double agent. And he quickly infiltrated this movement, along with another British chap called Bradley. And they had called something called the Dutt Bradley Thesis, which was a very cynical thesis, which was basically that the, by, this is around 1935, that they shouldn't be, the communists shouldn't be wasting their energy trying to, to help the freedom movement, and in fact, should infiltrate them that such that when, if and when the India did become free and these people had been exhausted by fighting the British, they would be able to take control of many of these movements. So it was a very cynical movement. And they seem to have got quite far with it because one of the interesting things that happens is that many of the revolutionary, nationalist revolutionaries that were sent to jail in the late, uh, in basically the early 30s, ended up being becoming communists, but interestingly became 
indoctrinated in jail with literature which was supplied to them by the jailers. And there is lots of interesting evidence of this uh, about how the British were very keen to spread socialism and particularly Marxism among the revolutionary prisoners they had. And so it is quite strange that those who were, became prisoners in the early 30s as nationalists came out of the prisons in the late 30s as communists. Now, today, some uh, latter-day communists claim that revolutionary movement was actually a communist movement. This is not at all true. What happened is that many revolutionaries became communists. Very few actual revolutionary activities were done by the communists. Quite to the contrary, the whole purpose was to indoctrinate them, to shift their loyalties away from the nationalists. I know this again because this also happened in my family. And one of the, these was a gentleman called Bhupendranath Sanya, one of those who got caught in that Kakori case. He became one of the leading communist uh, thinkers in the late 30s, and so on and so forth. Now, this turned out to be a very good investment for the British, of course, because of the Second World War. Because many of these communists who then uh, had become uh, ex-revolutionaries who had become communists would then, interestingly, fight for the British cause along the Chittagong area for the British against the INA. Now, meanwhile, some of the traditional uh, nationalist revolutionaries were still in action. Of course, now the Second World War is coming up. Some of these chaps had been involved in the Gadar uprising which included both Sachin Sanya, who was still alive, and Raj Bihari Bose, who had been living all this while in Japan, running a curry restaurant. And if you, any of you ever go to Tokyo, uh, do go to Nakamuriya. That restaurant still are, is there. It's not in the same building because that was bombed to the ground in the Second World War. But that restaurant still is alive, and they still use, they claim, uh, Raj Bihari Bose's original chicken curry recipe. Now, these two gentlemen began to create linkages and <clears throat> they were in contact by this time with Subhash Bose, who had become, of course, very disgruntled with the Congress Party having been eased out by uh, the Gandhi faction. So, <clears throat> in 38-39, as the war was building up, uh, there were many communications between uh, Raj Bihari Bose and Subhash Bose and Sachin Ransanya. Many of these, by the way, happened in my family home uh, in Lahabad and in uh, Kolkata. Uh, and in some of those meetings, the, the Japanese council was also present. So this is well before the events of 1942-43. This is before the war had started. And of course, then the war begins. Bose is put under house arrest. I mean, it's a house in Elegant Road. That house is now a national memorial. <coughs> you can visit it across the road from a lovely bookshop as well. Uh, incidentally, Calcutta's best bookshop, so it's a nice place to go and spend an afternoon. The car in which he escaped from his house is still there. And he very famously escaped from his car and was driven by his nephew uh, to what is now Jharkhand, from where he took, made his way through Afghanistan, through Russia, which hadn't yet entered the war, uh, to Berlin. And then, of course, he attempted to raise an army there, uh, which didn't quite work out because I think his chemistry with Hitler didn't quite hit off. But meanwhile, Raj Bihari Bose, who had been hanging around in, in Tokyo all this while, uh, hit the jackpot, so to speak, because the Japanese uh, attacked and took over Singapore and got large numbers, tens of thousands of Indian soldiers who surrendered on the surrender of uh, Singapore in um, beginning, I think, of 1943. This is, I think, early 1943. And so, how are we doing for time? Can I keep going for another 10 yeah, minutes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and so what happens is, Raj Bihari Bose, the old revolutionary, was the man who set up the Indian National Army. Those who don't know much about this movement very often think that it was Subhash Bose who set up this uh, Indian National Army. It was actually the, the Raj Bihari, the older Raj Bihari, the man who had attempted to do exactly the same thing in the First World War, who succeeded in the Second World War. And many of his old cronies who had, who had hidden away came together. But of course, by this time he was quite an old man. 
He was also not a military man, so to speak. So, I mean, his knowledge of military affairs by this time was quite outdated. So he relied on one of the junior official officers of the Indian Army who had surrendered for Mohan Singh to sort of get things going. Unfortunately, Mohan Singh turned out to be a bad choice. Uh, it, was a bit of a, uh, it was a bit of an egotistical character from what I can gather. And meanwhile, Raj Bihari Bose's health, his own health, wasn't great. So uh, this is the time in which he, the, you know, the younger Bose, Netaji Bose, and he communicated and he decided that this would be a good opportunity to bring Netaji Bose, who was, of course, already by this time very famous in India, and the soldiers knew him and so on. And he would then be brought uh, to Singapore and put in charge of the Azad Hind Forge. And of course, Netaji made this very famous uh, journey by submarine, uh, by a German submarine, and, which were, and then exchanged over off Madagascar to a Japanese submarine, and then uh, he went to, uh, to Singapore and took command. Uh, and he made this very famous uh, speech as well, uh, give me blood and I will give you freedom, um, and then inspected the troops. Uh, if you go to Singapore, the place where he did the troops, uh, inspected his troops, is the group is still there, the ground called Padam, where you would see the Singapore Cricket Club. Uh, it is there's still a memorial next to it, uh, which, uh, which is uh, a memorial to the INA. And then he gave this very famous speech uh, in a theater called the Cathay Theater. Yes, the Cathay Theater is no longer there, the old theater was torn down. There's a multiplex there, so in this hall, it's, it's, it's still a theater and a mall there. But the frontage of the building of the cafe theater has been retained as heritage, frontage, and you can still see it. And it's a short walking distance, in fact, from Palam. And then he went and lived on Maya Road, uh, the, on the East Coast, so, which is, of course, those of you who have anybody who living in Singapore will know that that's a total Indian ghetto these days, which is perhaps, uh, it's a second little India in Singapore. So, anyway, so that is kind of how the INA <coughs> got set up. And of course, there was a huge amount of enthusiasm for this as the Japanese triumphantly made their way through Malaysia, through Burma, to the borders of India. And large numbers of Indians uh, joined uh, forces. And in <coughs> meanwhile, of course, the British were in very tough condition. They had not imagined that Singapore would fall so easily, and certainly hadn't anticipated that Netaji Subhash Bose would turn up and sort of gather this force and, and so on, uh, and so they were very scared. And what they did then is absolutely dastardly, uh, and they basically withdrew food supplies from Bengal, including uh, the boats. And remember, in a riverine territory, you're simply removing uh, all the boats that could be used by the Japanese for any kind of uh, movement, they simply removed the lot. And the net result of that was the great Bengal famine of 1943, uh, in which at least 3 million people died. <coughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, the Japanese lost the war, um, the INA fell apart. What happened to Subhash Bose is, remains a matter of controversy and it is beyond the scope of this lecture what happened to him. Uh, let's say, at the very least, uh, it's, a, it's still uh, hotly debated. And uh, many true blue Bengalis will still bristle at the very idea that he may be dead. Uh, but anyway, the net result of all of this was, of course, the INA uh, surrender. So, in some ways, the revolutionary attempt at carrying out a second insurrection in the British Indian Army also failed, but didn't. And this is where the story gets very interesting and is very often ignored completely from our textbooks. What happened next is that the soldiers of the INA were brought to trial. Some of the very senior soldiers were brought to trial, in fact, in the Red Fort. And this became an absolute sensation, not just among the population, but also amongst the armed forces, who um, began to kind of grumble about the whole thing. Now, if you do visit the Red Fort, you, of course, everybody goes and sees Diwani Khas and the usual Mughal buildings. There is on, if you, if you are kind of coming through the main gate and looking at Diwani Khas and Diwani Khan, on your left extreme, there is a Bawi there, which is possibly a pre-Mughal 
structure. Um, and that structure is very interesting. Nobody visits it at all. And so it's full of bats and so on. So don't go there if you're squeamish about things. But if you walk down the Bali, there are a few rooms there which with windows and doors barred. That, those are the places where the senior of, officers of INA were held while their trial was going on. So anyway, this trial, however, caused a lot of grumbling among the British, uh, amongst the uh, British Indian Armed Forces. And this grumbling then reached a crescendo in, guess where, Mumbai, where the great, yeah, Royal Indian Navy sailors went on a mass strike, something like 20,000. In 1946, 20,000 British Indian Navy sailors went on a mass revolt. This revolt originally started not on one of the ships, interestingly. It started on a shore establishment called HMIS Talwar. Now, many people have not researched this or have researched it lightly, tend to think it's a ship. It's not. It's a shore establishment. And if you want to see the shore establishment, it still exists. You, uh, if you go to Kolaba to uh, the railway colony called Badwar Park, mm -hmm. and right next to it there is a, a naval depot where they keep all their trucks and supplies. So if you go there, it's still called, it is now called INS Talwar, but it still exists and you can go and see it. From there it rapidly spread up um, to the docks and then onto the ships. And very quickly, within a couple of days, <coughs> this group um, was in essentially in control of not just 88 ships but basically large parts of Mumbai and very quickly there were massive strikes the, the, the students went on strike uh, the, the government officials uh, industrial workers there was absolutely strike and uh, the Indian flag was uh, pulled up wherever they were available on the masts and uh, essentially the British had completely lost control of Mumbai and the Navy this point in time. Similarly, there was strike uh, took place in Karachi, Kolkata, and many of the smaller ports as well. Now, when the Indian soldiers were asked to go and take control of these places, um, and the Royal Indian Air Force was asked to carry out bombing raids, they refused. Now, this is the point, if you take the revolutionary view of history, when the British decided to leave India. In fact, it is a, at least a matter of fact that it was about three or four days into this revolt that Attlee announced the cabinet mission that would explore uh, India's independence. So, in the end, the revolutionaries did succeed in doing exactly what Savarkar had asked them to do half a century earlier which was to cause a revolt in the Indian army. The revolt itself fizzled out because by this time there were no senior revolutionary leaders left alive. Uh, Raj Bihari Bose had died of natural causes during the war. Subhash Bose had disappeared at the very least. Sachin Ranath Sanyal had died in prison. Uh, many of the others, as you know, Bismil, Azad had been shot dead along the way in Allahabad, um, incidentally attempting to visit my family home, uh, very close in Alfred Park. Um, and basically there were no leaders, there was no political leadership to take it over. Uh, only two uh, of the leaders had survived. One was Aurobindo, the original revolutionary, but he had by this time moved on to doing other things. And Savarkar, who had moved on to create the Hindu Mahasabha and was no longer really directly linked with the revolutionary. He had some links with them, but he was not really uh, the guiding force anymore. So, with no political leadership in place, uh, there was no way that they could keep going. There was no, nobody to coordinate things. And um, effectively, when Sardar Patel asked them to, uh, resu uh, to uh, so lay down arms, uh, they complied. And so they didn't get any support from either the INC uh, or from uh, the Muslim League. Uh, to their credit, the only people who did provide them some support was the communists. Uh, but they were too small a force. 
and anyway, uh, by this time, also seen with suspicion because of the infiltration by British communists of this movement. So the net result was, while this particular episode also didn't succeed militarily, I think the fair case can be made that this was the last nail in the coffin of the British Raj in India. And this is how the British occupation of India came to an end. At least seen from the perspective of the revolutionaries, it had very little to making salt on being done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't you sit down? We'll get the mic here. Uh, and you can sit and answer questions. So thank you for that fascinating account, which uh, convinces me more than ever. Who oh, might have yet? Convinces more than ever that a comprehensive history of the revolutionary movement in India has yet to be written where all these dots can be connected and the T's can be crossed. And we'll get a wonderful counter view to the established and dominant understanding of how India won independence. Uh, just by way of anecdotal uh, adding to the you know, narrative, because it's almost like something emerging, you know, either in the dark room, uh, in a photography studio, when you book things, uh, when the bromide you know, actually starts doing the pictures, Right? Uh, all like a jigsaw puzzle with all <coughs> these pieces. I just want to mention two little things randomly which came to mind, which is Bina Das in 34 tried to assassinate, assassinate Stanley, the governor of Bengal, and this whole Hijri jail became yes. IIT Kharagpur later. Yes. And a very fascinating character, again from Maharashtra, Tilak's uh, lieutenant, <coughs> Krishnaji uh, Khadilkar, who wrote these amazing plays, you know including Kichak Abad, you know, where it was an allegory of, you see, Kichak became the British uh, Empire, and Bhim uh, was somebody who killed Kichak, and, you know, Draupadi and the whole uh, <coughs> symbolism, uh, you know, of fighting either for your mother or for your spouse, whatever. But the interesting thing that very few people know is that uh, Tirak had sent this gentleman, who was actually a playwright and an editor of Kesri, to Nepal to create a bomb-making factory. And uh, the Rana uh, said, uh, you know what, I don't think we can take on the British. So he came back and started writing plays. That's one reason that Tilak was sent to Mandalay. You see, he was actually, he was destroyed in Mandalay, felt sick, and the reason was not the so-called seditious articles that were written in the Kesri magazine, which are very mild, compared to the real reason which is he had sent this guy to learn how to learn mm -hmm. So there is a lot that uh, was going on that uh, appears beneath the surface. And when we put it all together, uh, we get a very interesting and fascinating account. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. We'll throw it open. Uh, uh, please, uh, you know, we, do, we certainly see a dialectical uh, development. And I just wanted to add one more thing. If you look at the visual history of India, not, not the scriptal history of recent India, then characters like Bose and Bhagat Singh and the other revolutionaries are as popular as the Congress leaders. They show up in calendars and they're funny paintings of, you know, like Bhagat Singh sort of tearing open his heart and right there is Gandhi and Nehru, you know. And of course, Nehru also was the lawyer. He was a briefless barrister most of his life. But when the INA trials happened, he started defending uh, you know, the so-called mutiny soldiers, possibly to get some kind of cachet from the you know, so-called failed uh, revolution. But <coughs> throw this open, there will be more thoughts that will come up as we go on. It was stunning, as always. One of the things I was going to say about, uh, about uh, uh, Sanjeev is that uh, He's a very convincing speaker. So just as a challenge, you can give him the task of saying exactly the opposite of what he said. And he can still convince you, <laughs> you know? And uh, perhaps uh, I don't want to be wicked, be unkind here to my friend, but there are many reasons for being the principal economic advisor to the government of India. But one is that you can make a very strong case, you see, and carry it with conviction. But it was a mesmerizing account, and I'm sure there'll be um, responses. But the one thing that I was thinking is this old dialectic uh, 
that was going on between Savarkar and Gandhi goes all the way back to 1909. Because Hind Swaraj was written in 1909, don't forget. That was also the year when Savarkar wrote the first Indian War of Independence. And Savarkar's book was smuggled because it was banned uh, in, a, in, in, in a box containing Pickwick Papers. So it was disguised as Charles Dickens' famous book. But inside it was this incendiary, this is his favorite word, Indian War of Independence. And of course, Savarkar also changed, because if you read the Indian War of Independence, he's hoping for some kind of Indo-Muslim front, revolutionary front, against the British. But, you know, another 10 years later, he writes in the book, this pamphlet, which is so hotly debated. And this Anushilan Samiti is a, such a fascinating organization, speaking of Aurobindo Ghosh, Aurobindo, and all his poems, you know, as you said, you know, this, he wrote, he wrote the only poem he wrote in Sanskrit was called Bhavani Bharati. And this Bhavani Bharati, to whom he writes the poem, is the Tulja Bhavani of Shivaji, because he, he writes that in Baroda with the revolutionary, uh, you know, and he writes these revolutionary poems like Baji Prabhu, yes. you know, and, uh, and he, he wrote another very interesting pamphlet, which was, which was, uh, you know, confiscated when he was arrested in the Alipur bomb trial, which was called Bhavani Mandir. And that was written in 1906, possibly in Baroda, before he went to Kolkata and became the first principal of the first national college of India, which is now Jadavpur University. So there are many ironies to history. But Bhavani Mandir is precisely the text which preaches revolt by creating these secret revolutionary cells disguised as temples to the mother, drawing <coughs> inspiration from Bonkin. And the first Bhavani Mandir he wants to, wanted to set up was in Chandor on the banks of the Narmada. So all these little things, you see, the, the, the real task for a historian is to you know, bring it all together and see the plot. And I think Sanjeev's sort of signal contribution today is to show us the overriding you see, motive was to create uh, disenchantment in the loyal British uh, army. And it's sad that when you read uh, Subhashan Bose's, you know, writings during <coughs> 1944, uh, when he's marching to Kohima and saying, Chalo Delhi, he's confident that when uh, the Indian army sees its comrades on the other side in Kohima, they would drop their guns and join, but they didn't. And one wonders, what was that magic of British imperialism that made people so loyal to them? You know, this whole idea of Namak Alali, you know? That they did drop their guns and, and fired at their own comrades, you know? And obviously, Bose miscalculated this dream that the British Indian Army would throw down their weapons, join the revolutionary, for some reason, never took off. And it makes one think, as Chris Bailey says, that the empire the Raj was as much an empire of information. He's written this wonderful book called The Empire of Information, where without the spy system, the British could never have ruled. You know? And somehow, and when I went, you know, we've all been to China several times, and one of the first questions I was asked is, how come the British raised literally scores of regiments in India, Dogra Regiment, Maratha Regiment, Mahar Regiment, you know, Madras <coughs> sappers and miners. They didn't have a Bengal regiment. It was well, the time being after 1857, they found it was a bad idea. Bad idea. And the and the Bangladeshis raised the regiment. So when their uh, lieutenant general came to this building, he said the British didn't let us raise a Bengal regiment, but now we have. But what's what's really fascinating <coughs> is the Chinese. They could not raise one Chinese regiment. The Chinese never fought for the British. In Hong Kong and Singapore, they have to get troops from India, Sikhs and Gurkhas. So what is it, you know, Koreans, Chinese, the Orientals never joined a regiment when they were conquered, but somehow the Indians did. So this dialectic between Savarkar and Gandhi, which had begun in 1909 at India House, where Gandhiji did go and meet all these revolutionaries, maybe there was a germ of truth in Hind Swaraj when he said Indians Cannot do this. So in fact, this, this dialectic, yeah, so the dialectic 
between those who wanted to fight and those who wanted to collaborate is a very important one in this whole story. Not necessarily just collaborate, just to create. Oh, and then it, but the word collaborate comes at various. Some could be willing to just. No, there is just some other ways. Some and could, but I have. The question to you is this: that Gandhi said this is against the temperaments of India. This is a not. So no, what I'm trying to say first the debate. Yes. How do you resist it, or do you collaborate? And, and there are many shades of grey in this. But I think the very interesting, the, the, the revolutionaries obviously thought a lot about this. And the, but the first place where this is written in a very interesting way is by Aurobindo, where he has this fictional conversation between, uh, well, no, between Shivaji and Jaisi, <coughs> Savai Jaisi. And he's having this conversation uh, and which basically Jai Singh says that I am a soldier, I followed the dharma of a soldier, I fought. I fought for uh, Aurangzeb, he was, he's my king and I fought for him, that is my dharma. And uh, Shivaji says, what sort of a dharma is this? When the person is persecuting your own people, what, what dharma does that mean? So this conversation goes, but then it goes on and then in the end of that conversation, Jai Singh says, uh, what good was your uh, great uh, resistance? In the end, you, uh, you know, the Maratha Empire <coughs> happened, then the British uh, conquered. So he then makes a very interesting say, I don't remember the word, but basically, uh, my main point is that the nation I created and the dream of freedom that I kindled is not yet dead yet. So that last line, but it's, it's more elegantly written than the one I have just stated, but it's it's a very, so this point exists and of course some people were well, collaborating or whatever by joining the British army. But point out that obviously throughout this period they were also seen with some suspicion. They were very much prone to revolt as well. I mean not 1857 they had revolted. And of course the Gadarites were clearly feared by the British. Uh, and there were enough revolts and then they thought that something nasty could happen because the Raul attack was put together. Um, the INA did happen, and of course the mutiny uh, in the Na uh, Royal Indian Navy did happen. So it wasn't the case that the revolutionary approach uh, didn't entirely work. However, there were people who did collaborate much more wholeheartedly. And the history of those chaps would be very, very interesting, because now that I'm researching this history, I am also finding these collaborators everywhere. And their history is also quite shocking <clears throat> because many of these uh, uh, chaps would go on, yeah, go on to become very privileged people uh, post-independence and would become very senior, <coughs> sometimes in government or in society at large, and their descendants continue to <coughs> prosper in Latians Delhi. Um, I'll give you one example which is a particularly shocking one. Now, after Premchand, perhaps the next best known writer in Hindi is supposed to be a gentleman called Yashpal. Some of you heard of him. Yashpal made a great career out of his life as a great writer. After independence, he got Padma Bhushan and, you know, he was much awarded, rewarded person. The fact of the matter is, <clears throat> um, he was seen with great suspicion, even though he's a part of the revolutionary movement. By around about 19, uh, the late 20s, his colleagues in the revolutionary system were extremely suspicious of, them, of him. Um, I know, of course, this from my own family thing, uh, history, uh, but there is now a lot of other evidence. So it turns out that when Chandrasekhar Azad, uh, <coughs> by the way, he did a bunch of things after, after uh, Bhagat Singh was captured. He did one, he tried to blow up the Viceroy's train. He carried out an aborted attempt to uh, rescue Bharat Singh from uh, jail, which failed. Uh, and he did a bunch of other things. Uh, in the midst of all of that, uh, he went, they had a meeting in Allahabad. And uh, when this meeting happened, <coughs> he um, uh, was uh, one morning uh, walking in and around uh, Alfred Park. Uh, as I said, my family lived in Karnail Ganj, right across the road, so it's quite possible he, he was visiting Sachinraj Sanyal's family at that time. And he was identified and then shot. He ran into the park, hid behind a tree, but then 
ultimately was surrounded, and of course he then <coughs> used the last bullet to kill himself. Um, now, this whole episode happened because obviously information was provided about where he was. But till that point, the British had still not, did not have a photograph of Azad. Uh, so they only vaguely knew that he was a rather large uh, some, uh, and, uh, 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 man, and maybe some descriptions. Uh, so the question is, how did they know he was there and how did they identify him? Now, it is known reasonably well that there was one relatively well-known person who was a spy who had provided the information. But that spy was a very minor person who knew that Azad was perhaps in Allahabad, but nothing more. Whereas we know in the trials uh, that um, happened later, uh, or the hearings that happened later on a trial, um, that the British had clearly a lot more information. So the question is, where did that get that information? Now it turns out that this information was provided by Yashpal. And Many of the revolutionaries very much were suspicious of Yashpal, including Azad himself. And in fact, Azad, it is very likely, had, was perhaps looking and hunting for Yashpal to kill him at that point in time. Now, having, of course, uh, with him killed and many of the others killed, Yashpal would, a couple of years later, uh, be captured in what would be at best described as a pretend shootout and would end up in a, the luxury wing of Naini J. And he would make a big deal out of it later on, suggesting that he had been a great revolutionary and had been captured in a shootout um, and so on. But in fact, uh, the revolutionaries didn't believe it for the very simple reason that a serious revolutionary was never sent to Naini. He would be much, almost certainly be sent to Kalapani. Number two, very strangely, he lived in Naini jail with his wife which was clearly not uh, a punishment posting, let's put it this way. Even more shockingly, after independence, there was a gentleman called Dharmendra Gaur who worked for the CID, who, you know, somewhere in the 60s, came across a bunch of documents in one of the CID's record rooms in Lucknow, and found in there a bunch of letters, uh, 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 letters which had been written by <coughs> Uh, in 1946, uh, from one British uh, intelligence officer to another, saying that now, you know, we are now going to be sort of unwinding, so to speak. So, uh, the time has come to begin to sort of make arrangements for our informers. And he mentions there Yashpal's name. And he specifically mentions that this gentleman, Yashpal, had been very useful to us in 1930-31. That is when Azad was killed. And then later on was used to infiltrate the communist movement. Wow. So Yashpal was 100% true that he was a, uh, he was a, an informer. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, several members of my family were looking for him to kill him. Uh, so, you know, he's not, let's say, a very popular person in the family. Uh, anyway, but after independence, he made a very big deal out of his... Uh, his Can I add a footnote to this Yashpal story? I'm also told that in order to deflect blame from himself, he wrote that Chandrasekhar Azad was betrayed by Savarkar's brother. Mm, possibly. And there's a lot of controversy about that. Please read up on it. And every now and then, when this so-called internecine battle between the fascists, so to speak, and the communists erupts in its this India is avatar. This is always brought up, that the man So, so this is now reasonably well known because the documents are in public domain. You can actually read them. You can, in fact, I'll send you a photocopy there's a of this. There's a book by Yashpal where there's a hint about the, that, uh, that Savarkar's brother. There's a confusion because he was also called me. So to make a distinction in Maharashtra, this is Swatam Tira Veer Savarkar and Veer Savarkar. It's a funny little thing there. But now let's get a few questions, otherwise we're just going to go and have tea or whatever it is you're going to do. Any, any, anybody has anything to say? Please, sir, please. Is there another mic? Is there another mic? Is there another mic? Is there another mic?
दूसरा कॉर्डलेस माइक कहा है गौरव जी थैंक यू ये देखिए आप यही कर आप यही बैठे So, so obviously, I gave you a very short history of a very of a half a century of uh, activity. So, it is a short history. I have not dealt with every detail of every uh, event. So, absolutely, the British were very much uh, physically and mentally and economically drained at the end of the Second World War. But it must be added that they had also been physically, emotionally, and uh, economically drained at the end of the First World War as well, not just after the Second World War. So, uh, in an, after all, they were exhausted enough that right next door, the, the tiny population of Ireland was able to basically declare independence in the 1920s, uh, when India couldn't, uh, to the great annoyance of the revolutionaries, which they held against Gandhi ever since after that. So, while the economics of it is important, I would say, had it not been for the spark of the Royal Indian Navy, uh, it is possible that, uh, you know, the Quit India movement would have been just like uh, the um, non-cooperation movement <coughs> and we would still be attempting to make salt. And that the spark I will, I will add a footnote to this. When Churchill was the war prime minister, he asked, he sent a note saying, how long can we hold India? So the reply, possibly sent from these environs, was that we can hold India for another 40 years, but will it be worth it? That's the note that goes back to Churchill. Will it be worth it, the expenditure, the force, whatever we have to deploy? This was the, so, uh, and then of course the government changed, Clement Attlee came, which is no longer a conservative government, they had a different agenda, but, uh, so I think that's a <coughs> fine response. Ajay Ji, please. Uh, Sukriya Sanjay Ji, uh, it's a sundar Rakhangi Ji. Sir, you have to know the last thing, I want to know the last thing. I am not a teacher. तो मुझे उतनी जानकारी शायद नहीं होगी तो मेरी क्वेरी है जैसा आप कह रहे हैं कि बहुत सारे क्रांतिकारी को या तो फांसी हो गई थी या गिरफ्तार हो चुके थे और दो लोग लाश में बसते हैं या तो सावरकर बसते हैं और अरविंद जी बसते हैं तो जो आप ये बात कर रहे थे कि वो हिंदू महासभा बनाने चले गए तो सर उस जो क्रांतिकारियों का जो सपना था एक विजन को लेकर जो चले थे तो ऐसी क्या जरूरत पड़ी कि सावरकर के हिंदू महासभा बनाने के लिए हिंदू महासभा पहले बन चुकी है और मुझे लगा सर जो मैं समझता हूँ नहीं नहीं वो तो पहले बन चुकी तो ट्वेंटीज में ही बन चुकी थी तो बट ही हैड मूव इस टॉकिंग अबाउट ऑफ फोर्टीज यार हैविंग यू कैन स्टिल आंसर आई एम सेइंग दैट हिंदू महासभा पहले बन � 
तो सावरकर जी ये आई स्पीक इन इंग्लिश बिकॉज़ देन विल बी द सेम लैंग्वेज ऑन योर रिकॉर्डिंग सो द थिंग दैट हैपेंड इज द फॉलोइंग इट्स इंपॉर्टेंट एंड दिस इज व्हाई इट्स वेरी बोथ द स्टोरीज आर क्वाइट इंटरेस्टिंग आई हैवंट फुल्ली डन द सावरकर रिसर्च बट द ऑरबिंदो रिसर्च इज डन बी इक्वली फैसिनेटिंग व्हाई ही लेफ्ट ओके नाउ रिमेंबर श्री ऑरबिंदो ओरिजिनली ऑरबिंदो घोष is not a trivial character in our history he is now we remember lal bal pal but in fact fact there were four he was the fourth he was just as important as lal bal pal in the nationalist garamdar he then found simultaneously the revolutionary movement he you know he and uh, many one of the raj bihari bose one of his uh, disciples that goes and does many things so an important character and he then escapes goes off to pondicherry he is still fully doing that's when he is in touch with subramanya bharati and subramanya bharati writes many of his nationalist poetry being inspired by aurobindo uh, bose not a trivial character but then by the by the time the sec- uh, the first world war ends he drifts off into completely different tangent so why does he do this so i actually spent some time thinking about this so i read some of his writings of that time and it's fascinating why he did he basically makes the case that look he thought that look india one decade two decades three decades will will eventually be free so the war of political freedom he has pushed it over the edge and there are now many people whether through armed revolt or peaceful means whatever it will become free he however said that, however the problem was that the intelligentsia of india had become deracinated and emptied of its attachment to roots to indian civilization as a result of many hundreds of years of occupation and as a result the greatest danger was that we would become free but not be attached in any way to the civilization that we were attempting to free so why did he come to this conclusion in the you know 100 years ago when this is by the way still a matter of debate today the reason is his own life you see you have to see what happened in bengal in the 19th century in the 19th century with the collapse of uh, after 1857 and various other things happening remember bengal had been captured the earliest and had therefore gone through british rule for a fairly period of time and had been subjected consequently to macaulayite education for a long period of time now macaulayite education had two very different impacts one was that it in fact opened indian eyes out to modern narratives education etc in fact triggered many of the nationalists of various hues but it also simultaneously triggered a group of anglophiles and the brahmo samaj is where all this happened the brahmo samaj emerged originally as a hindu uh, reformist movement but by the late 19th century it had split into various groups and one of these groups basically became very much attached to the british cause and his arobindo's father was one of those people in that movement to an extent although he hadn't quite converted to christianity he mm-hmm. abhorred everything indian L- tried to live as european in his life and one of the things he did of course was to take all his sons and send them off to britain to basically be brought up as englishmen completely cut off from indian civilization so orobito was very very conscious having in later life having rediscovered india uh, indian civilization as a foreigner he was very conscious that india would become free but would be inherited by a intellectual class that was essentially no longer connected to its roots and therefore he thought that that was the real battle india had to fight and so he then switches to fight that battle and i have a feeling savarkar probably went through some similar kind of thing but i haven't fully researched savarkar so you'll have to hold your horses on that one but there's a great book just about to come out the i read from sampad where i'm so pdf you do have it so maybe you know some more about it than i do i'm supposed to write a blurb but i suspect you see to add to this it's a fascinating answer because it's a very non spiritual answer 
Yes, you go to Pondicherry, you will always get a spiritual answer mm -hmm. that Shorabindo wanted to transform human consciousness because he felt that the problem was in changing, you know, the way human beings have hardwired their approach to life. And he wrote fascinating books during that period, including the ideal of human unity, where he believed that world government, you know, whether or not economic globalization happened, world government was going to happen in one form or another, though he predicted the collapse of the League of Nations already. Anyhow, but so the Aurobindonians will give you a spiritual reason, but I think the cultural uh, and the civilizational reason is also compelling. It's in his own writing, so you know, don't take my word for it. Yeah, he writes yeah, about it clearly. In so. foundations of Indian culture, it, it, it opens like that. It opens by saying that this is the last, uh, India is the last culture <coughs> which represents a non-modern, non-European, Asiatic, authentic civilization. And remember, though he doesn't mention it, Heidegger and Husserl were talking about the inevitable or the, you know, foregone conclusion of the Europeanization of the world. So how would you resist it? Because modernity uh, was a phenomenon because it was fueled by capitalism and other things, you know, which was going to penetrate even the remotest corners of the world, especially through technology, which people in Europe had discovered. So what was the counter to that? So, and as to Savarkar, I think that uh, in, Dhan in Dhananjay Kiel's book, if you read it, the thing about Savarkar was he became more and more marginalized, you see. Mm. And uh, so when he gave up the so-called revolutionary idea of capturing, uh, you know, the independence movement through armed revolution, he thought he would try the political manner of doing it and competing with the Congress and the Muslim League. But unfortunately, the Hindu Mahasabha won no seats at all. So he became this kind of marginalized uh, patriarch, you know, and every attempt to rehabilitate him as the father of the nation has to, to, to date fate, because somehow, so that was a different kind of, uh, uh, you know, you might say, departure from the mainstream. That is, with Sherman though, and it was last, much more deliberate. It was mud, and you know, in fact, I went to the house, the Chetty's house, where Shurabindu came uh, from Chandranagar, you know, in a boat and so forth. I think Chandranagar was Danish. No, no, it was also French. It was a French? Okay. So he came from there, and uh, there was a peephole to see who was going to visit. So there were spies that the British had sent to Pondicherry to make sure he was not really a good But eventually, or, yeah, But eventually they came to the conclusion that he had really turned yogi. And I think there was another reason for that, which you did mention, which is the mother. But then it's much later. No, the mother came in 1914, and he came in 1910. She moves in, so to speak. She moves in in 1920. But in 1914, there's a decisive moment when uh, Paul Richard comes and, you know, there are two tendencies in Aurobindo. He was always a grand narrative builder. And he felt that, you know, using occult power to change human consciousness was the way to go. And one reason, I think, is the mother uh, presented this project to him, which was irresistible. Mm. Uh, the project for the transformation, not just of a nation, but of humanity. Mm. And, and when she came permanently in 1920 and built up the ashram, many miraculous manifestations of that grand project mm. started, uh, uh, should I say, appearing, mm. materializing. And that maybe convinced him and that's a very important date, you know, when the descent of whatever the Krishna consciousness <coughs> seems, seems to be recorded, you know, in the Aurobindonian circles. But that's going to take us into a completely different direction. So let me now invite our secretary, Sri Premchand, to give a vote of thanks and we call this meeting to end. Okay, last couple of questions. Okay. Please. So thank you so much for inviting this course. I was wondering that talked about trials after INA. And were there no trials after 1857 by the Britishers against Indians? So if you can tell me something about that. See, I haven't researched 1857 quite so closely. They were obviously major trials. But remember, at that stage, 
they, they, are, they weren't putting too much effort into the trial. See, by the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, the expectations was that you did a trial of, which was not just, you know, summary trial where you say, okay, next, hang him, next. That kind of approach was no longer. Even the Nuremberg trials had to go through some show of actually doing a fair trial. Uh, the same thing happened in the Tokyo trials, yeah. or wherever they happened in Japan. Um, so, <clears throat> 1857 was a much more rough and ready manner. So, for example, um, Bahadur Shah, of course, himself was sent off to uh, Rangoon. But uh, Bahadur Shah, frankly, uh, contributed almost nothing to the cause. It was one of his sons, Mirza Mughal, who, to the extent uh, he contributed anything, to the Mughals contributed anything to the cause, he was the poor chap who attempted to genuinely put up a fight. And Mirza Mughal was... Uh, dragged out of Humayun's tomb, taken to the place uh, 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 today called Kuni Darwaza, which is uh, near Ferozha Kotla, yes, yes. and he was shot with a cold uh, revolver. So, pretty summary, as you can imagine. So, the, the, the 19th century and the 20th century were very, very different uh, cultural uh, milieus. In fact, uh, the summary trials were such that there is a local legend because Mangal Pandey revolted, you know, from Kanpur to Delhi, every Pandey that was caught was hanged. So the trees lining the Grand Trunk Road, all the way from, was it Kanpur or Lucknow, whichever is further east. Well, he, he revolted in Barakpur. In Barakpur. Uh -huh. But the fact is he that, from Kanpur, that he, yeah, I mean, he was an Avad person, you know, there was no real revolt in Bengal. The revolt was among the Avad soldier, soldiery which came from upper classes and castes. From Aval and, and uh, North Bihar. And that's why, you see, they, Bajadali, etc., they liquidated, uh, you see, Aval, and that was one reason for the revolt. Anyhow, but the point is, every pandy that they could find was hanged on, on, on the trees from, from wherever, Lucknow or Kanpur. One city to another, which are the two major Which the further east. Which is further east, Lucknow is further east. So, Mahan said, uh, but last question over there at the back. Yes, he can. He also has. Oh, I propose. I have a question. Oh, you have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. One second. One second. Question related to me. One. One. Okay. 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 Sir. Just, just give it to me. Niki Mukherjee, a historian, has published a book. Uh, you know, it, it's a book on, uh, you know, uh, it's a book on uh, imperial or constitute or imperial or colonial constitute. Constitutionalism in the British Raj. And uh, her conclusion is that before 1857, there was imperial sense of justice and colonial injustice. And the imperial sense of justice empowered the Supreme Court uh, and put, uh, put the court above the Governor General or the Governor of the Executive. And after 1857, the imperial sense of justice was completely, uh, you know, dropped, and uh, the judiciary was subordinated to the executive. Uh, yes, and then, then Pinter Ji will ask the last question and also propose the question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I saw that hand first. Yeah. Then, but don't forget the famous trial was the trial of Raja Nanda Kumar, yeah. and if you look at the records. The British wanted to send a message because they wanted to violate Hindu taboos against Brahmin Hatya. So Raja Nandakumar was a Brahmin and he was hanged. And all of Hindu Calcutta moved because of the pollution. You read the, this, we don't know. For a period of about two or three weeks, I don't know, whatever the ritual period was, they moved away from the white town to show their protest against this public killing. And that's how the, 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 it is the British who instituted things like beef eating and all of that, you know, and Young Bengal was famous for that yes. in Presidency College, right. etc. So the deracination that he's talking about was a very serious business at that period. So there were these different techniques that the conquerors had used to demoralize the local populace. And empty them. And empty them of their values, you know, yes. the, the, the scale of values which binds a society. Objects of reverence, you know, codes of conduct, 
etc. These were well, talking be, of iconic. Yeah. See, for example, if you read the accounts of the Islamic invaders, one standard practice was they would take an idol and hang it with a carcass of a cow and said, okay, you're worshipping this car, uh, idol. Now let's see if the idol can retaliate. Mm. And in front of everybody, they'll say, see, kuch nahi karta, it's a piece of stone. Then they'll say, now we're going to smash it. So you, you know, so you, you know, you defile something, that way it can't be worshipped, then you smash it. The British did it in a more subtle way. But it was done consistently. Uh, and uh, so justice also. And one of the people who signed off on the hanging of Raja Nand Kumar was none other than one of the greatest Orientalists of India, Sir William Jones, who was a member of the Supreme Court of India. Yeah, yes sir. Sir, sir what are the triggering factors which has revolutionized the minds of Britishers in 1947 that they have to leave India by Agastya? So, so that was the point I was making, is that the usual <coughs> story is that, uh, you know, the Congress party had quit Mindia movement and pushed the whole system and then of course, then the spiraling violence between Hindus and Muslims uh, uh, that was happening. So, this could, uh, so, so, so that was, and, and the, that is the conventional history. Yes, that I am asking triggering points in 47. Yes, so that's what I'm saying. So the conventional history is that no, this was a 47, just to clarify. Yeah. yeah, sir, only in 47. Only 47. The Quit India movement. Yeah, so, so, so the revolutionaries would argue. So yes. I, yeah, so the revolutionaries, as I pointed out, had a different view of the matter entirely. Their view was this was a matter of having a serious, triggering a serious revolt in the British Indian Armed Forces. So their view of the matter is this massive revolt happens in 1946. In the middle of that revolt, the Atlee sends the, the cabinet mission, and not surprisingly, it had, you know, the, the, the date is the next year, because now you cannot any longer hold it together. If this revolt had happened in 47, we would have become free in 48. That would be the revolutionary point of view. And incidentally, this uh, entire approach is not some new view that I have suddenly come up with. Uh, there are many credible uh, observers of that time who had this view that the revolutionary movement through Bose um, uh, ultimately led to freedom and on record saying so and Ambedkar being one of them in a very famous <coughs> uh, uh, interview on BBC which you can <coughs> pull it off YouTube uh, he says that uh, this is the line of action that led to freedom and not the uh, Gandhi's peaceful movement. So uh, there are many credible observers of that time who took this view that it was the revolutionaries and not Gandhi who led to freedom and consequently then 1947 uh, would have been, a, the, the 1946 uh, would have been a particularly trigger. important trigger. And remember this happens in Mumbai and of course Ambedkar is from Maharashtra so he just would have, he may personally have observed it. As well. But then why they have taken one year? No, no, one second, one second. See, the point is that uh, as a counter sort of position, you can say the two were not binary, it was all going together. But now I'll come to your question. You know, the British were supposed to leave in January 48 or, or, or maybe later, I don't remember exactly, but they advanced the date. Why? Because I'm personally I'm So that is what I'm asking. They wanted a dis what? specific thing. No, no. They wanted a disorderly withdrawal which would leave the subcontinent in chaos because the message they wanted to send to the world is when colonial rule ends, there's chaos. And they, they established it. In fact, they went out of their way. Yeah. I mean, for example, you look at the Radcliffe. Yeah, the episode. Radcliffe line. The Radcliffe line yeah. is, yeah, it's randomly uh, put in there in a very short period of time. It was drawn in this building. It was drawn in this building. I thought it was. So yeah, a I thought there. it was put together. Okay. Because I thought Radcliffe was living in what is now the Rashtrapati Bhavan in a house. No? Where Ashok Malik lives. I thought that was where he was living. We were told it's in. And maybe he came here as well. Yeah, he came here and in that summer he drew the line. Okay. Before so you can see that there is complete breakdown happening. And remember, the. the <coughs> the British were in charge. There was no political party, and they looked the other way. The army and the police were directly under the British, and the worst carnage took place in 
So th this breakdown completely happens uh, and you know 15th of August was an entire surprise uh, to both the, to everybody in, to, to both the Congress and the Muslim League who were thinking in much longer time frames. So why specifically they chose the date is not related either to the is not in my view related to the freedom movement in that sense. It had some sentimental value to uh, Mountbatten, uh, Sri Aurobindo as well, but to a sentimental value to uh, Mountbatten because that was also the day the Japanese surrendered. Pimchenji, last question on the support of that. Uh, Mike, the region is already. Uh, my question is there is a statue of uh, Ras Bihari Bose in the Naus with the place called Kelong, which is a very remote place. There is no center, <coughs> there is no road. At that point of time, there was a uh, there was, there, people established a statue, and local people have no idea why the statue was built there. And some of uh, this. Sorry, going on because then Raj Bihari was stayed there, he hid himself from the rest. So, you have any idea about what is that you were built there? Where exactly is this place? The place on Lahore Well, okay. Okay. okay, I have no idea why it is there. But let me say that he does have some link to your neighboring state, Uttarakhand, because he did a lot of this stuff while being in the for, uh, Forest <coughs> Institute in Dehradun. So, and he was, of course, going up and down from Masuri and so on. So maybe he did visit it for some reason or whatever. Uh, that's one possibility. The other possibility is a very is a simpler reason, is that when the Ghadar movement fell apart, he had of course a network of people who were suddenly had to run away, um, and so one of them may have escaped to Lahore Spiti and uh, lived there and built it. So I, I I don't know the answer to your question, but that may be one explanation. I can also say just as a last point that. It's absolutely beyond question that there was a network and that people had assignments. See, I was growing up on the outskirts of Bangalore in a suburb called Whitefield. And when I was about 10 years old, a gentleman came to settle in Whitefield. His name was Mr. Ganpole. And he's written a book, so you can check it out. Bharat Vidya <coughs> published the book. And, you know, it was a small community and my mom was a social worker, so they said that Mr. Ganpuli has come in and would like to call on you, and he's also a social worker. And we discovered that he was an associate of both Rasha Bihari Bose and Subhash Chandra Bose, and he had a bunch of money. I mean, the, there was a huge bank that was created, and all the revolutionaries were funded, and when they were, got liquidated, each one of them settled in different parts, and they wanted to serve the country. And there was a very interesting... Uh, then he passed away. Before he passed away, he made a... He, you know, he called my dad, my mum, and other people, which is not in his book. And he said, look... And he was a bachelor. He had no family. Or he had a family of <coughs> relatives, but he didn't want to give any of them money. And I was a young boy, and I asked him, why don't you give it to your family? He says, no, this is the nation's money. And then I said, give it to the government. He said, are you kidding? I don't trust the <coughs> So he wrote a will in favor of Satya Sai Baba, believe it or not, and it became a hospital, his land, his home, and his money. So there were these people all over who then settled in India, and this is exactly the counterpoint to the collaborators who before the British left were also well taken care of, yes. placed in various, and we don't want to name famous people, they were given contracts, they built Delhi, their descendants, mm -hmm. Are still here and there. They're still writing our history. They're still writing histories. We won't take names. But both sides took care of its own. And on that wonderful note, Pim Chanji will propose a vote of thanks. Yeli, you take this. Uh, on behalf of the institute and on behalf of the director and entire uh, fellows community and staff members of the institute, I extend uh, a deep vote of thanks to Sri Sanjeev Sanyaji for sharing his experience and the research work he has carried out uh, in the areas of the um, uh, unsung heroes of the freedom, freedom, freedom struggle. We are revolutionaries played a major role in India's independence. I thank you very much for your time and
And uh, I also thank all the participants, faculty uh, from university and uh, others who have joined this, uh, this event for this for this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And also nice uh, fellows, uh, offices, and okay. flats. Okay. So feel free to finish your book here. Okay. And let's try to launch it here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have one of our most pleasant uh, duties, which is to honor our speaker with our traditional Himachali shawl, okay. which comes from Kulu. All right. And the Himachali shawl. I hope it fits, otherwise, see, trophies, one thing where one size does not fit all. <laughs> but if it doesn't fit, we'll exchange it. But let's just try it for the part. Okay. Does the job. It looks lovely, actually. It looks very nice. Oh, it's good, good, good.